Okay, I hope the recording is started. Hello everyone, um, thanks for joining. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce Ben Hall from Team Katakota uh, in London and thank him for providing us this great session together for um, our second meetup, online meetup, uh, basic Kubernetes training and challenges to becoming uh, cloud native and more. Um, so the more part, I will uh, introduce our next meetup, very short, that's our uh, third meetup, it will be um, a virtual class on Saturday, next Saturday and um, early in the morning. Um, currently we have we have only 25 uh, seats for virtual classes because we want to um, have that interactive via not go to webinar but uh, via go to meeting so you can share your screen if you have problems by setting up for instance uh, Kubernetes via COPS on, on AWS. And um, one more uh, session which we are going to announce very soon after the first virtual class, it will be our second virtual class, is about CI CD um, with, uh, yes, on, on the same environment which we are going to set up on AWS uh, with COPS. Then we will go through CI CD process and how to integrate Jenkins and uh, perhaps some some um, information about monitoring and so on. So and then um, the last thing, if you don't know our um, uh, Slack channel, you can reach out or join our Slack channel at uh, kubernetes.slack.com. Uh, for a self-registration on our website, you will find here at the bottom a link to to the self-signing page. So that's uh, from my side. Thanks again for joining. I will now give the control to Ben. Ben, thanks you. Hope it works for you now. Hopefully. All right, should do you see my slides? Yeah. Perfect. Very nice. Excellent. So welcome everyone. Um, so tonight, um, what I want to talk about is the challenges of becoming cloud native. So cloud native is definitely a hot topic. Everyone's very excited, but actually in reality, many different companies face many different problems. And so when I started thinking about what the journey looks like and what the journey people go through, I generally found there's different scenarios and different use cases which people have to deal with on a daily basis. Um, so things like there's Windows applications. We've got ASP.NET, they've got some sort of traditional traditional approaches, traditional technologies, which requires Windows, and that's a large part of everyday DevOps at the moment, and infrastructure. But also people are still going through this journey of moving to microservices, they're still refactoring traditional um, large monolithic um, applications, and we're not always in this beautiful microservice um, oriented architectures, which while that's definitely the goal, it takes a long time to get there, and that's just the reality of how it that's kind of reality of software development. But even if we do get to this beautiful microservice architecture, we then have the problem of dealing with hundreds of these services. How do we manage and how do we scale them um, and not have a huge amount of complexity and interdependencies? And this is a problem which many teams run into. Um, and again, dealing with big data and how did that look? But fundamentally, right, what is cloud native? How do we get people started? Um, uh, how do we even deploy Kubernetes? And it's these kind of problems which hopefully applies to the people watching. Um, and I think these are things which we need to pay more attention to. Because like at least in my experience, these are the problems which people are dealing with on a daily basis. And so this is what I want to talk about tonight. Because sadly not all of us can be a cool shiny little startup um, deploying a nice little uh, microservice application um, onto Kubernetes. I want to talk about what it looks like when you're deploying traditional applications, what it looks like when you're deploying real applications um, onto Kubernetes itself. So this is what I want to talk to. This is the agenda for tonight. So I want to start with an introduction into 
Kubernetes, just set the landscape, um, explain some of the tooling, some, some of the approaches that you can use to bootstrap um, the system. Then talk about how do we do things like deploying Windows containers onto Kubernetes and what does that look like um, as we go forward into deploying everything as a container and using everything on top of Kubernetes. And then finally moving into, right, we've got Kubernetes, we've got applications being deployed. How can we move traditional applications um, and move them to Kubernetes without having to make large um, impacts, large changes to the application, application itself? And finally, looking ahead, looking towards tooling um, such as Istio um, and how that can help us um, manage microservices. And so hopefully we get to see this journey from beginning um, to deploying traditional applications up to what it looks like when we've got this beautiful microservice oriented architecture. So for those who uh, haven't come across me before, my name is Ben Hall. Um, you can reach me at uh, Twitter, Ben underscore Hall and my blog is blog.benhall.me.uk. For me, I am the founder of Catacoda. Catacoda is an interactive learning platform for software developers. We offer interactive tutorials directly in the browser, along with interactive environments, um, which are um, all available, all for free, and you can get started really quickly um, with everything pre-configured, um, and you can explore and experiment without the concern about how do you set up and how do you configure everything. And if, if you want to try different technologies, we've got a range from Docker to Kubernetes to DCOS um, to OpenShift, all available um, on catacoda.com. So let's start with getting started with Kubernetes. Like for some of us, I'm sure um, we're familiar, but I just want to do a recap for those who are potentially new to the topic. And so we need to deploy it. And this is where the challenges start to begin because there are so many different variations and so many different approaches to actually bringing up um, a Kubernetes cluster itself. There's some great tooling such as Chaos, um, which um, will be the topic for the next um, Kubernetes meetup, um, AWS Kube, Kubesway, Kube Boot Kube, et cetera. And if you're dealing in a cloud, things like the Azure Container Service is awesome. You've got GKE, you've got the Hipto, um, Quick Start Guide for AWS. Um, and so this really helps bring it up um, and brings up the cluster. But for me, my personal favorite is Kubeadom. Kubeadom for me is the most um, agnostic way of launching a cluster and actually gets you started in a very low friction way. Um, and at least it gives you something to start playing with, start seeing the moving parts and start giving you something to experiment with. And then from there you can go off um, and you can stay, uh, scale it out. And so this is what I want to start to demonstrate and start to explain how you get started. So on catacoda.com, on our website, as I mentioned, we've got different courses and different scenarios um, covering a wide range of topics, um, like Prometheus, um, so Docker, Kubernetes, Prometheus, Docker security, and then running in things like how do you run .NET inside of Docker, how do you run Java, etc. But what we want to talk about today is Kubernetes and the awesomeness that it is. And so what I want to talk about is Kubeadam. So if we go in here and get started, um, what we do is a quick introduction, and then we give you two um, terminal windows. We've got a master and we've got a node. And these are complete boxes, they're complete um, machines. They just happen to have been pre-configured with Docker installed and the Kubeadam and kubectl tooling. So now we can use Kubeadam to start initializing and to setting up a cluster so we can start playing with it. Um, so in this case, we're going to run Kubeadam init and give it a predefined token um, so that we know what token to use um, when nodes and other things within our system want to uh, connect and join our cluster. And so what Kubernetes does is takes away all of the pain of getting Kubernetes set up. So the first thing it does is run some checks. So this just makes sure that you're running an up-to-date kernel, you've got all of the correct C groups in place, um, you've got all of the correct um, dependencies and requirements in order for Kubernetes to run successfully. And if you do, then it gives you some nice, helpful hints on how to actually get started and solve and um, fix those problems. But if everything works correctly, then they start generating certificates. So these certificates are used to ensure that uh, all the communication within the cluster is over TLS. When you join and want to administrate your cluster, it's all done in a secure uh, way out of the box. And so that we're trying to get to the secure by default mindset. And so this is really helpful because 
I least in my experience, getting the certificates and key set up is one of the most troubleshooting and painful parts. And so it's really nice that Kubeadm just gives you a quick way in order to get that started. And so as you can see, it kind of walks down, it sets up all of your certificates, we get some configuration, and then it starts to make sure that everything can be deployable. So it just checks that all the control plane components, so this is like XED, the API manager, um, the scheduler, um, et cetera, all running and they've all started correctly. Um, case RBAC, and now we have our successful cluster. Um, and we have a token. So we have this command which we can run on any node which we want um, to join and be part of our cluster. For example, our second one at the bottom here. And so what this will do now is we've gone off, we've given it the IP address um, of our master, and we've given it the token which it needs in order to be able to successfully join and talk to our master. And so well, again, it goes off and checks to make sure that the node is uh, configured correctly. And then it will do a handshake. It will make sure um, that it's talking to the correct master based on the token. It will get all of the required certificates. Um, and then it will start um, all of the kubelets and kube proxies on that node, um, which we've done in our second step. Um, and so now we have a master and a node connected together. This command simply um, configures um, how we can talk to the cluster. So this file has got um, all of the certificate information, it's got the IP address of the master, um, etc. So this is allows us to rem remotely administrate a Kubernetes cluster from our um, local machine or maybe from a CI, CD server um, and talk to it in a secure way. So that's our certificate and this is what kubectl will use um, to talk to. So now we have get nodes, we've got um, a master and we've got a single node um, which currently has the status not ready. Now this is to be expected because at the moment it's not because we haven't deployed this container uh, network interface, the CNI. And there's lots of different CNI providers, um, Project Calico, uh, Flannel, Weaveworks are just some of the few available and they're all defined on the website if you go into the uh, Kubernetes documentation. Um, there's different variations, they all work and have different priorities. Um, and solve different problems. For example, some work nicely with Cisco and um, traditional Cisco infrastructure. Um, others have different priorities. My personal preference is Weaveworks. I know the company very well. They're an um, awesome team, um, got some awesome products, and WeaveNet works um, really successfully. And so the way that you deploy a CNI is using just a YAML definition. Um, so this is the definition for Weaveworks. You can see it's configuring RBAC and creating all the cluster roles. We've got a daemon set for all of the networking policies um, and the network configuration. So this means that it will be deployed automatically onto each node within our cluster. And so what we can do is we've got this YAML um, to kube could all apply and that will go off and deploy this container networking interface. And this allows all of our nodes and all of the pods inside of our network to communicate um, even if they're on different um, machines or different clusters. And what we can do is get the pods, see what's winning, and now we have successfully deployed WeaveNet. And if we go back and ask um, for the status of our nodes, you can see that they're now both ready and are both ready to start deploying um, workloads. For example, we can deploy a nice simple um, HTTP server, and that will go through the process. So downloading the Docker image, configuring um, scheduling the workload um, and then that's been um, issued and run on our um, individual node. And uh, we can do the same with things like deploying the dashboard um, and again this will give us a nice pretty UI. And so out of the box what was that? within a couple of minutes we went from having two empty machines um, to having now a working fully deployed Kubernetes cluster and we can go ahead and add more nodes and we now have something to start uh, working with and start uh, experimenting with um, and push into production if we wanted to. So this is a really nice way and this removes, at least from my opinion, removes the initial challenge of how do you even get started with Kubernetes? How do you even start exploring it? Um, and so that's what I wanted to indicate at the first example. Um, and so this provides that great out-of-the-box experience. Um, but there's also other approaches. So 
with Kubernetes, Kubernetes tries to be very agnostic. Right? You can select your own um, container network interface, there's different um, approaches which you can take, and it doesn't try to be opinionated. It tries to be this very open platform so that everyone can join, um, join in, which I think is amazing. But obviously different companies want different approaches, and so this is why we've got different opinionated versions of how to run Kubernetes, such as uh, Tectonic from CoreOS or OpenShift from uh, Red Hat. Now, OpenShift I uh, think is awesome. Um, and as part of Catacoda and the OpenShift team, we've built um, a project called learn.openshift.com. And this kind of helps you understand OpenShift and helps you get started um, and understand how it's different, uh, what features it has, and how do you solve um, certain problems with it. Um, so again, everything's driven in a very interactive way. So if we go in and say, uh, get started with OpenShift for developers, we start with an um, introduction into OpenShift, some of the advantages, um, some of the understanding and background into the project. And OpenShift itself is uh, Kubernetes under the covers with some really nice advantages built on top um, by the Red Hat team. And so out of the box, you get a more opinionated deployment, but you also get some really nice benefits at the, th uh, at the same time. So for example, um, we have things like logins and authentication through the command line. So we can say, um, log into the cluster. And in this case, we're just using a developer account, but we now have um, credentials. And so each developer within the team can have different roles and responsibilities and have different um, permissions on like, which projects they can deploy to, um, who can administer and who can view and et cetera. So this provides out the box a really nice way to start thinking of it at a more rollout, large scale deployment. You also get this really awesome dashboard. Um, so again, if we just log in with our developer developer credentials, if I can type it correctly, um, and this can guide us through deploying our first project through a dashboard. So if we come in, do just something simple like, I can't type, um, test project, Um, so that will go ahead, um, and, and OpenShift comes with a catalog. So not only can it deploy pre-built images, it can also take a Git uh, repository, run it through its own internal build pipeline, produce a Docker image, and then roll that out um, into production, which I think is uh, awesome. And it can solve a lot of, uh, lot of the moving parts about how do you actually deploy um, something onto a Kubernetes cluster when you only have a Git repository. So if we do something like a node project, and um, we can select the version, which we the runtime version, and we can do something like node one, and give it, oops, node one, uh, give it a Git uh, repo, which we want to be built. And this is just an example, node project built by the OpenShift team, and then click create. And so what this do will do in the background is start building the project um, and start deploying um, the OpenShift, uh, start building the Node project, and then we'll deploy it as a container onto our winning cluster. And so what we can see in the dashboard is we've got this um, Node project, which has been deployed into our test project. So again, it's taking, really enhancing the use of namespaces within Kubernetes to make sure that every project can be separated and isolated and managed independently, again, taking advantage of that uh, role-based access controls, which are built in um, to OpenShift and now Kubernetes itself, um, based on the work the team has done. And so we get um, to see the build process, um, and this will go ahead and this will um, slowly build um, our Node project, um, just again, running Docker under the covers. You can see that it's now, um, run through NPM install, and it's now pushing that built um, Docker image into an internal registry. So again, this again reduces some of the moving parts and some of the um, complexity required in terms of uh, migrating to containers and deploying Kubernetes, because OpenShift provides an entire package from um, the Kubernetes orchestration itself, but also things like a private registry, having the routing built in out the box and available to really cut down some of the moving parts um, that you need to think about when you're um, 
moving to a, a this new cloud native based approach. Uh, so this is uh, slowly working through. Uh, the node uh, image isn't the slimmest of run times, um, but you can see that it's going ahead and pushing through. But we wouldn't just want to deploy um, Git. Sometimes we have our own CI CD processes, um, and so we can build um, existing applications. So in this case, we've just got a um, HTTP um, service, and so we can just point it at our um, Docker uh, Docker Hub image, um, which will go off and get the details. Click create, um, and then that will again that will now go off. Um, pull down the image um, and then launch the pod um, which you can now see happening here. So um, it's just pulling the image and again this is where the dashboard is really a great um, indicator into what's happening in the covers. Um, so we can see what's happening so it's now going off and pulling the image and we now have this one uh, pod running. If we wanted to scale up um, it's just nice um, with an UI we can just click the up arrow and now we have two versions um, of the pod running which I think I think is really nice. Um, in the meantime, our node application has deployed, um, has been built, um, successfully has deployed. Um, as I said, not only is the registry built in, but we also have routing um, out the box. And so if you go onto this um, app, um, and you see the node sample application which has been built, all of the routing, all of the been built has been managed by OpenShift, um, which uh, kind of solves a lot of the moving parts and gives us this uh, great experience that we can uh, kind of start building building upon. So I really liked uh, these two approaches because for me this solves um, that getting started stage. And so now we have something which we can start working with and start deploying uh, real applications on top of. But now we get into the issue of are there real applications and we have real concerns. And so we have to deal with different types and different architectures for example, things like Windows containers. And for me, Windows containers is a great example of the impact that Cloud Native has, has had on the ecosystem as a whole. Not only have we had containers in Linux for the last um, number of years, the impact it's had and the uh, benefits it's driven in terms of deployment, in terms of security, in terms of scaling our systems, had made and encouraged the Windows team to adopt containers and build them as a native aspect within the Windows kernel itself. And this is why we have Windows containers, which allow us to take the same workflow which we have with Linux, but run natively and run native Windows binaries um, um, on top of Windows Server itself. So this brings the best of both worlds. So we can take the same tooling and the same mindset what we had with Linux, but approach uh, apply it to our Windows, uh, our Windows applications. So I was thinking about a good example of where this can be indicated. And so I found um, a project on Coplex. Coplex was used to be an awesome um, open source project hosting um, way before um, GitHub, or kind of just when GitHub came about. And I found this example called Nerd Dinner which was built by the ASP.NET team um, and was released in May the 25th, 2010. So that's a pretty, that's a pretty good application. Um, it's got a lot of um, history behind it and this is kind of the things which people may have to deploy. Sort of which hasn't been built, hasn't been recompiled in a while, but they want to bring it away from traditional VMs into a managed um, Kubernetes cloud native um, based approach. And so this is now what I want to go ahead and deploy. So as I said, the Windows containers look and feel very um, traditional, uh, very familiar based on how they work in Linux. So we have a Docker file and instead of doing things like from Nginx or from um, a Linux operating system, we now can say from Microsoft uh, Windows Server Core. And so this is um, an almost compatible Windows um, deployment. It's been designed for running inside of a container, but it's um, got all of the same APIs, it's got all of the same functionality you would expect from a Windows Server itself. And in this case, we're simply saying that we want the Docker image which has got IIS um, 
built and deployed as part of that Windows Server Core installation. And so this is very similar to saying from Nginx or from Apache. But in this case, we're saying from um, IIS. And then the rest of the doc file feels familiar. We're setting a shell, saying that all the future commands will be run via PowerShell because we're now working within a Windows um, ecosystem. And so we don't have bash. Instead, we're using um, the PowerShell approach. And then we can issue commands um, to run as part of our build process. For example, install Windows features. Um, so we very similar to doing an app get installed. So we can go off and say install the .NET Framework 4.5, install ASP.NET um, 4.5 as well. And so the GIF gives us our dependencies on top of IIS. And then finally, we can say things like uh, deploying our website and configuring IIS. So we're moving the default, creating a new directory, and then um, creating a new IIS directory to point um, to that. And then finally, at the end, copying over our source code. So very similar, very familiar to building Linux images and the same mindset and the same tooling can be applicable when now building these Windows containers, which is awesome because we don't have to um, rescale, relearn new technologies. And again, um, because everything's built in this consistent way, the image itself can be deployed using Docker Run, um, expose port 80, give it the name of our image, in this case, Nerd Dinner, and we have our deployed um, application running. But what does this look like in a cloud native? And in particular, what does this look like when you're dealing with Kubernetes? So the team, um, the Kubernetes team have done some awesome work and uh, they have now got a Windows binary and Windows installation available so that we can deploy these Windows containers as if they're um, in exactly the same way that we deploy normal Linux containers on top of Kubernetes. So what we have here is I've built a two node cluster. We've got our master, um, which you would expect from Kubernetes. Um, the master is the traditional master. It's running on Linux. It's got all of the things you would expect, such as the um, API server, the control manager, and the DNS, all the traditional tooling you would expect um, from running uh, Kubernetes. The difference in this case is our node is actually running on Windows. You can see if we describe it, we've got the operating system of Windows. Um, we have uh, our kubelet running in this case. Um, and it looks and feels um, very similar um, in terms of how it works. And so we can now start using this node to deploy uh, Windows-based containers. So if we look at a pod definition, again, all of the syntax has remained consistent. So we've got our image, in this case, Microsoft slash IIS. We've got pool policies. We can define ports as we would. The main difference is we've now got this node selector. And this node selector says, um, what operating system does this pod need to run on? And so in this case, we're simply defining that it's got a dependency that our um, operating system needs to be Windows. And when we describe our node, if we do grep, um, OS equals, you can see that um, the node has a label selector of um, OS um, equals uh, Windows. And so when the kube scheduler is deciding where that pod should run, by having this node selector, we can say that it should always run something which is running Windows. And then hence, we'll have support for our Windows containers. And if we do kube could all apply, this will deploy the IIS pod, we can do um, get pods, and we can see that it's creating. Um, we can describe that pod, um, and it all looks and feels um, seamless. It all looks and feels um, this great consistent experience. And now, no matter what types of containers and what architectures we're deploying, whether it be Linux or Windows, everything feels and works in exactly the same way. And so we can use existing toolings, existing build processes, existing CI, CD, um, no matter what architectures we're running on. And again, when we're dealing with services, um, we can still take advantage of things like node ports and load balancers, um, which can be deployed and configured um, consistently, whether we're now targeting Windows or Linux. And so these pods and everything take a little bit of time to boot up, um, just because of the nature of the beta at the moment. Um, but if we can deploy some more things, so again, this is a nerd dinner. We can do kubectl apply. 
deploy our pods, um, get everything running um, as you would expect. So we'll come back to this in a moment once it's been finished, um, booting everything up and we can see that results. But what I wanted to indicate was even if we're dealing with these traditional applications which require Windows, we can work with them in exactly the same way that we would work with microservices or Linux based um, applications using the same tool sets and same processes than what we had before. So this work had been done um, in collaboration with Windows, uh, the Red Hat team. Um, details are all on GitHub. They've been very open and transparent about this integration. And we've done a demo. Now, this approach is very uh, considered kind of lift and shift in many ways. Um, you're taking traditional applications and um, deploying them as containers and then pushing them onto Kubernetes. But I think this is really good and really valuable um, and actually something which can solve a lot of problems because we can now take applications which were previously hard to deploy and they deployed very infrequently and bring them into this container based world without having to make modifications and without having to make changes. But as I'm sure we're all aware, as we're going through this process, um, we always start off with good intentions, even if we start with a blank slate and everything always becomes somewhat comple complex and somewhat, um, they always have some intricacies um, with applications as they've grown over time. So what I want to explore is how does that look when we're deploying onto um, Kubernetes? Um, and what does Kubernetes do in order to support applications which have grown um, and have got some interesting deployment problems? So um, in terms of what your application needs, um, does your application need to change if you're deploying onto Kubernetes? There's some really great features which make it, um, which makes it much simpler to take applications without requiring modifications and deploy them onto Kubernetes. So things like ingress routing, session affinity, and local only, and which I want to discuss. So ingress is a way for us to define routing rules based on how our application um, needs to be deployed and how our application URLs and the services which need to respond in order to do this. So I think this is awesome when you're going through that journey from having a monolith um, system and breaking it down into microservices, potentially re-architecting it into different languages or different components. And so what we have in this example is that um, anything going to the host catacoda.com, um, if the uh, URL contains slash payments, then the order service should be the one to respond. If it doesn't, then everything else should be responded by our normal application. And so what this allows us to do is as we slowly break things out from our um, traditional system, for example, if we add another rule or something like slash um, profile, then we can actually say that actually now this is being handled by our profile um, component of the system. Um, and that's now been broken up and um, made it easier to deploy and configure how our routing actually works in very low friction way um, based on dealing and having support for path-based routing. routing. So I think this is a really good approach when you're thinking about how you're going to split up an application without having to do um, a big bang style release and a big bang style refactoring. Having these ingress controls makes it much easier to start rolling out some changes over time. The other approach one with um, certain traditional applications have is they like to store things in memory. Um, so they don't use a backing store like console or XCD or Redis. Instead, everything is stored in memory. And so as a result, um, every request needs to go to the same host or the same uh, pod in the case of Kubernetes. And so this is where the ingress has affinity and session affinity, which means that when one request comes in, that request is always stuck to the same pod. And so in this case, we've got our ingress, which I defined before, um, but we've extended it. And we've extended it with some annotations to define how that routing should look. So we've defined um, our class, in this case, um, Engen uh, Nginx. We define our affinity based on a cookie. So what this means is um, when that user comes into our system, a cookie will be allocated, and then that cookie will be used to define uh, which pod they should go to in future requests. And then we've also defined some additional names, like what's the name of our cookie, in this case, um, root, and how, what's the hashing algorithm. So again, 
applications which have got some interesting ways of needing to be deployed and needing network configuration, Kubernetes has enough support there um, to make that possible and to give you those options. And finally, um, the approach of Kubernetes networking uh, has got lots of different hops. Um, when you're running inside of a container, the source traffic may not be the external um, IP address, it may be an internal IP address or load balancer, which has been defined. But for certain situations, particularly in financial um, situations, you need that source IP address about where that address came from. And you don't want that to be masqueraded and hidden based on uh, Kubernetes or how the containers are deployed. And so what you can add is this annotation saying external traffic and say local only. And this will keep the IP address of the um, source of the client throughout the journey of that um, network packet. And so your application, which is running in the pod, will still have the IP address, um, the source IP address of the client which made the original request. And again, if that's important to you, um, many previously this was a blocker to thinking about how to move to a cloud native style approach. Yet with these new annotations which are being added, this is no longer becoming an issue and it's becoming much simpler in order to migrate and um, move our systems into Kubernetes. And there's lots of these features which I think are underappreciated and one of them is pods. Uh, pods, uh, sidecars, and controllers. So controllers allow us to add additional functionality um, based on what our application needs. And so we have our traditional approach of having the API server, having our controller manager, having our schedulers, but we can add these additional controllers which manage um, something which could be particularly interesting based on what our application requires. For example, it needs to hook into an external system and do some mapping between what that external system does um, and how Kubernetes requires things, such as secrets, and how we access and manage his secrets. So Kelsey Hightower, one of his many awesome demos is a secrets controller. And I think this is a really good example of um, how Kubernetes can be extended. So custom controllers are deployed um, in a very similar way to deploying everything else on Kubernetes. In this case, we're deploying it as a replica set. We're pointing it to the um, secrets image uh, and deploying some arguments, um, in this case, how do you talk to Vault, which is deployed within our Kubernetes cluster. And so now when I see uh, our controller is running, it's basically a loop, and every time around the loop, um, it can check, and in this case, it can uh, think secrets. So because we're running inside of the Kubernetes cluster, we can get access to Kubernetes um, environment, we get given an access token, um, and so we can be aware of the context which the control is running in. We have our uh, Vault client, which in this case is where our secrets are. We can go off, get our token from the um, token which was defined when we deploy the container. And then we've just got this go loop. And so for every 10 seconds, it just calls the function. And I will go off and check to make sure. This case is thinking secrets, but it could easily be um, controlling how our application works or how our application is deployed. And so again, when we think about these complex edge cases, having the ability to support and deploy our own custom code into Kubernetes can really make it um, solve some interesting problems for us and start bridging systems. And I think this is really important when we think about pods and sidecars. As I'm sure many of us are aware, pods, while many people think of them as a one-to-one -one relationship with um, a Docker container, actually a pod can contain many other containers within it and they can all act and have the same IP address, the same volume and act as if they're running on that same single container. And these pods can now have additional functionality which can uh, do translations between different systems. Oops, going backwards. Um, so one advantage which I really like and one pattern I like is sidecars as adapters. So this has been used within the Kubernetes um, DNS system and the covers. So we all have, I know, um, this view, I'm sure. And when you look at Ready, you can see that um, for most of the pods, it's a one-to-one -one relationship, which meaning that the pod has got one container running inside it. Before the DNS, we've actually got three. And this means that there's three um, containers running inside of that one pod. And if you go and describe what that pod looks like, um, 
we can see that we've got these sidecars and we've got this Kubernetes DNS sidecar running. And uh, what this sidecar is doing is actually translating and mapping the DNS masquerade um, metrics, which are proprietary and in some uh, interesting format, into Prometheus and making it available and making it consistent with how the rest of the uh, Kubernetes ecosystem um, locks. And so this is a pattern which I think is really cool because it allows us to take an existing system which has got no awareness of what Kubernetes or Prometheus is, deploy this additional sidecar which can do the mapping, and then that can be the responsible for pushing metrics or exposing functionality into the rest of the Kubernetes and the cloud native ecosystem. And we see this again with StatsD, um, which is a very um, common approach. Our application has been configured to push metrics and insights to a StatsD server, but actually now we're deploying into Kubernetes, we'd prefer it to go into Prometheus. And so when we deploy our pods, we have our application, which has been completely untouched. It pushes into a StatsD exporter um, on localhost because it's in the same pod, so it's got the same network. And what Prometheus is doing is actually scraping from the StatsD exporter. And this is the one which is responsible for bridging that gap between our application, which has been untouched, to Prometheus, which is our new shiny world which we're heading for, towards. And again, this starts helping um, deploying our applications. Prometheus is really cool. Um, we can add these kind of tokens, which says uh, annotations. So if Prometheus, when it's doing a scraping, it can actually decide uh, automatically what pods it needs to be scraping from. Um, so in this case, it's a node exporter. We're deploying it as a daemon set. And so now every single node um, within our cluster has um, a node exporter, which is automatically configured to um, for Prometheus to scrape metrics um, based on how everything's running. And I think this, again, is a really nice approach about how we're moving um, towards this cloud-native um, Kubernetes cluster. So this is all very cool and all very shiny and nice. Um, but after a period of time, as we build up these microservices and we push towards this um, awesome system, dependencies are going to be introduced and um, it's always going to start becoming, uh, it's always going to be an interesting thing to manage. So what ways that can this cloud native approach um, help and mitigate some of the problems? And so this is where Istio comes in. So this is a um, platform um, which has been created by um, different companies such as uh, Google, IBM, and Lyft to help manage, connect, and secure microservice deployments all running on, at the moment, Kubernetes, but in the future, DCOS, Cloud Foundry, and other different orchestrators. Um, and so Istio is a service mesh. And service meshes are a very hot topic right now. They're very popular, and we're seeing lots more adoption based on how um, the Kubernetes um, Kubernetes and cloud native uh, uh, adoption is going. And this is um, an, kind of an explanation by uh, the creators of Linkerd. Uh, Linkerd is a service mesh, which is part of the cloud native foundation. Um, and they define a service mesh as a dedicated infrastructure layer for making service up to service communication safe, fast, and reliable. So they say that if you're building a cloud native application, you need a service mesh. And I think at a certain scale, that is particularly true because it solves this problem of routing and that communication and making sure that everything in the system is secure. So let's see what it does and how um, Istio actually looks in reality. Um, so what I've done is I've gone ahead and uh, we've got a Kubernetes cluster running. Um, it should hopefully have two nodes which have been set up, um, which it does. Um, and I've gone ahead and I've deployed uh, Istio. So Istio runs as um, configuration within the Kubernetes cluster. So in this case, we've got some roles and some role, uh, role bindings for the RBAC integration, um, some authentication um, so that it can manage and configure the cluster. Um, and now these should all be running as pods on a system, which they are, which is awesome. Um, and so Istio is made up of certain uh, components which we've deployed. So um, the first concept is a pilot. So 
a pilot is responsible for configuring different parts of our system at runtime and configuring the networking, configuring the um, routing policies and making sure that the overall uh, cluster is um, matching our desired state. And then at an application level, we have this uh, sidecar proxies. And so this is what actually manages our ingress routing, uh, the traffic communication between different, um, different parts of our system, different parts of our uh, application. And so this will manage everything like um, service discovery for us, it manages the routing, but it's also got things to handle how our application works and how our application behaves if there's errors. So introducing concepts like circuit breakers, and if a certain part of our system is unreachable or is being slow and not responding, then how should our system respond? And this is where all of that traditional complexity, which used to be part of our application, is now being pushed down and pushed into the service layer mesh, this infrastructure layer which can handle it and for us and allowing us to keep our application simpler um, and also meaning that we don't need to introduce so much custom code dedicated to how um, how our application works based on the cluster it's running in. Again, it can be much more agnostic to where it's being run. Uh, we've also got this mixer. So the mixer is the link between how Istio wants to com configure the networking and how the network and infrastructure is actually configured. So this is that bridging gap. So this knows how to talk to Kubernetes and the CNI and make sure that everything is configured correctly. And if we open up uh, this image in a new tab, um, this is kind of how it looks. And again, it's taking a huge advantage and building upon um, the concept of pods and sidecars. And so we have our application, we have our sidecar, which has been configured. Um, for managing the routing, um, going off and handling things like TLS, um, secure naming, and this, the managing the secrets between the two different pods. And so now uh, we've got all of this happening at the infrastructure layer instead of our application needing to be concerned with TLS and, and security details. And uh, one of the benefits what it, we have is we get routing um, and metrics built in the project. Because Istio is working at a lower level, it sees everything about how our applications are working and how our applications are communicating. And so it can expose metrics to Prometheus, and we can make that pretty with some awesome Grafana, um, Grafana dashboards. Um, Service Grass gives us some dependencies, and finally, Vipkin for adding some tracing elements, which we'll see now. So these are all of the core components. Everything's running as a pod within our cluster, um, and this now configures <coughs> the actual underlying SEO runtime. We've deployed the role bindings, we've deployed the configuration, and now we've deployed all of the awesome extensions and add-ons on top, such as Prometheus and Grafana. So when it comes to actually deploying our application, um, we can take a traditional application, um, for example, in this case, we have um, a bookstore or book info app, um, which simply defines some rules. And this is the YAML definition um, for what that application looks like. And so there's nothing in here which is defining the routing, defining um, Istio configuration. It's simply defining our deployment and our services um, and the Docker images which we want to be deployed. So now when we come to deploying it, um, we have our um, Istio Cuddle, Istio Control, um, and this can take our Kubernetes um, YAML definition and inject its own sidecars and its own proxies, and then that is what gets pushed and deployed um, into Kubernetes. And so this is how we can inject all of those interesting uh, sidecars and extensions into the pod without our application actually needing to be changed or modified because this is happening when we deploy our app. And so now we have our applications running, we've got our products page and some other review services, um, which is communicating that. And as part of our deployment, we also deployed our ingress routing. Um, so we've got our product page route, we've got a login, log out, um, which are running on different parts uh, and different parts of our system. And the result of our application is this product page. And so at the moment, um, 
we hit our product page and a product page goes off to different microservices in order to populate um, the review and the star ratings. And so every time we do a refresh, given this example, we get back a different indication. So version three has these lovely red stars. Version one doesn't have any version stars at all. And uh, version two has these black stars. And so this is just doing it in a traditional round robin based approach. Because we now got the service mesh, we can start configuring how that routing works and how that routing operates. And so if we come in uh, to this example, this is an indication, an example of where we can start defining which parts of the system should um, respond based on a cookie set based uh, cookie set by our application. And so we're saying that um, given a cookie with the user logged in as JSON, then they should always go to version two of our reviews um, route, the reviews route, which defines our um, black stars. And so if we go into our app, you can see at the moment, which being uh, load balance between a few different ones, it, if we go in and log in as JSON, and do oops. Um, you can see that at the moment we still got a red stars. If we actually deploy our change to our routing, um, under the covers now, Istio will go ahead and um, apply this routing change, update the underlying um, service mesh. And so now, if we hit refresh, you can see that we're always being um, responded to by version two of our um, routing. And so this is really cool if you're thinking about. How can you do things like feature flags or canary releases? Because that's now a routing level concern. It's part of our routing infrastructure, not part of our application configuration. And so we can say that actually when um, a user is part of our internal network, they should see the new version. But if it's an external user, for example, if we sign out um, and hit refresh, then they get the traditional experience what you're seeing. And this is kind of the power of what we're seeing and with being able to do traffic shaping and being able to control how the routing works. So in this case, we're defining a new, uh, a new routing rule for our reviews um, route, um, reviews um, service within our cluster. And we're saying that 50% of the traffic should go to V1 and 50% of the traffic should go to V3. And so we should never see these um, uh, non-colored stars. And so if we deploy that, now, in our cluster, what's happening is we're being, um, uh, we're going 50% of the traffic is going to V1, 50% of the traffic is going to V2. Now, I was doing many refreshes. This isn't because it's round robin, it's simply random. Um, so, what we're seeing is that we're being stuck to the same session for a time, and then a period of time, um, it will flip over and go back to V1 or V3. Um, on a large scale system, obviously, many users wouldn't notice. Um, and I would see that 50-50 low balance traffic. Um, so this is great for doing things like canary releases and um, where we can say, send 10% of the traffic to our new application, check to make sure it's working, and then uh, send 90% of the traffic to um, the uh, existing version. Um, but let's say we're happy with that deployment and now we want to start changing the routing and deploying more. So in this case, we've got, again, um, defining the routing rule for our reviews and displaying what stars. And we're simply saying that all of the traffic should now go to version three. Um, so we deploy that routing rule. Um, oh, and I've broken Catacola. Cool, let's <coughs> edit that out of the video later. Um, so that's not going ahead and deploying everything um, based on our cluster. Um, we'll look over that. Um, but as that's kind of like going ahead and updating itself, um, what actually happens in the background is we're also getting all of these metrics and these insights into what's happening. Um, uh, while this loads up. So this is our Grafana dashboard, which is hopefully loading. Yeah. And so what we can see is as part of our um, Grafana, um, as part of our routing, we were sending metrics um, based on what the responses were and how the responses were behaving. And so we're de seeing um, the different services. So this is our rating service, our reviews, our products page, 
and we're seeing the response times, um, we've been seeing the success rate, um, and we're seeing um, which uh, the response codes for our application. And so because Istio is at that level within our system, it can really gain some really great insights into how our applications are working. Not only that, we also can start seeing things about um, tracing. So because we've got this um, open tracing and Zipkin built in, um, when this loads up, we can see all of the web requests which we were making, um, and we can see things like some of them were being slow, and so we, or uh, some of them were taking longer. Um, so we can drill in and actually see what was happening within our system. So this is the overall request. We can see that our request went off um, and called our um, details, and then it went off and called our reviews. And we can start using this to gain um, insights into potential bo bottlenecks within our system, potential errors, potential um, performance problems at an infrastructure level instead of our applications needing to be concerned about how Zipkin um, operates and how to display it. We can also start drawing pictures about what our application looks like and how our application um, dependencies works. And so in this case, you, it's automatically drawn a dependency graph based on our product page. It's in and it's got the product page goes off and calls our review service, so version one, version three, and version two. It also goes off and calls some detail service, and the reviews has got this dependency and rating. And so a really great way to start visualizing um, and start understanding how our application is structured and what dependencies um, actually exist. And so this is nice, service class is um, pretty, um, but a prettier one, which I prefer, is a product called Scope. Um, so if we go ahead and deploy this, um, Scope is a tool by Weave. Weave, um, as I mentioned, do the container networking, but they also have Scope, which is a troubleshooting and visualization um, tooling, and they also have tooling for um, collecting metrics based on Prometheus, and CICD called um, solving CICD problems and connecting um, Jenkins or GitLab um, and making um, deployments automated um, to your Kubernetes cluster and keeping everything in sync at the same time. Um, so what the scope product does is if we make that available and hopefully you can display, it visualizes what's happening um, on your Kubernetes cluster and visualizing all of the dependencies and how um, everything operates. And so in this case, we can see all of the controllers which have been deployed. So we have our product page and we can also see that it's talking to the SEO, the product page part is talking to the SEO pilot. And again, this is being used to get by our sidecar um, within the product, this proxy which has been deployed um, as an extension in order how to define how things are configured and how the routing should operate. If we start issuing some traffic, um, which hopefully will now respond, there we go. Um, so everything's now been deployed. We can see that we've got our red stars uh, have been updated and um, we can see that scope has started to dynamically update our dependencies based on real traffic happening through our system. And so now if we look at our product page, um, it's now going off, it's sending metrics to Zipkin, it's um, communicating with the mixer, which is the underlying, um, handles the underlying infrastructure, it's talking to our review C3, which is where we told it to send all of our traffic, it's going off um, and calling our detail service to populate the page. If we look at reviews, then again, um, we can see that dependency that reviews is talking to our ratings pod um, and sending data is going to request incoming um, from our products page. And again, then pushing data into Dipkin. So I think it's a really nice way of visualizing what's happening, no matter what our application is. So if we're taking something which we're not familiar with or we want a better insight into how it's moving, just by deploying scope, we have that um, overview and that visualization happening and then we have Istio, which is powering the communication and giving us much more control over how our applications communicate within our um, Kubernetes cluster. Um, so I think this is really cool, especially when we're starting to think about um, taking existing applications and not needing to modify them, but still getting all of the benefits of Kubernetes 
Kubernetes, um, metrics, tracing, um, all of this really cool cloud native um, abilities. And so this is what we deployed. Um, everything was running as a sidecar in our, our pods. So our actual underlying applications didn't need to change um, in order to take um, advantage of this. And as a result, we got uh, Prometheus Insights, we got the Zipkin integration, everything was running over TLS um, automatically, all managed by Istio, so we didn't have to worry about that um, overall encryption. Um, and so we got some really great advantages. Now finally, hopefully this has given you an insight into um, some of the advantages and some of the some of my opinions based on how you can take existing applications and not need to modify them in order to stop benefiting from Kubernetes, be that whether it's Windows, um, applications, Linux, microservices, monoliths, um, this, they can still um, play in this awesome community um, without it needing to be a modern microservice based um, system. But obviously we still have a lot to learn and Kubernetes is a growing community and it's as we adopt it with teams, it can be difficult. It can be difficult to know what is actually important and what do you actually need to know and be aware of. And so this is where Catacoda comes in. Um, we, as you may have saw, um, we've got lots of different browser contents, um, kubeadom, um, deploying using kubectl, explaining the actual YAMLs, ingress, now doing things like using kcompose for migrating um, Docker compose and deploying it onto Kubernetes, and awesome um, community projects like Helm um, for making it easier to deploy packages onto Kubernetes and Weave Scope, which I demoed you um, with Istio. And we've got more content always coming. It would be great to hear feedback. If there's something which you'd like to know more, then please do um, let us know um, and it would be great to more. So we are out of time. Um, so I just want to summarize um, based on what we've been talking about. So when at least from my experience, when I started looking at things like Kubernetes and Cloud Native, it did feel like there was lots of moving parts and difficult to break down what was important. And I think this is normal adopting any technology, be it Docker, Kubernetes, um, Node.js, Golang, it can always be feel like an uphill struggle. But when you start breaking it down and with the approach what the community is taking, I think there's some really cool advantages which are coming, which really simplify and remove these blockers and these challenges in order to moving our systems into this cloud native approach. So what I've demonstrated today is um, how can we can use Windows containers in order to build and deploy our um, applications, um, no matter the architecture in a consistent way, how we can use sidecars and pods in order to deploy, um, in order to bridge the gap between our application and new systems which we want to integrate with, such as Prometheus, without our applications needing to be changed, and then how we can push forward and how we can really take advantage of Kubernetes and microservices and use this service mesh, this Istio, in order to have more control over routing, more control over traffic paths, and for, as a result, get um, TLS encryption, all of the integration and all of the metrics um, out of the box. And so with that, I am um, I have completed. Uh, thank you very much for listening. I hope you found it, um, found it entertaining and interesting. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me, ben at catacoda.com. Um, tweet me, ben um, underscore hall. Uh, and I look forward to hearing and uh, talking with you um, some more. And with that, I will hand back over uh, controls. Thank you. Yeah, Ben, thank you very much. Wow, so great. <laughs> that was really um, the world of cloud native and Kubernetes only in, in an hour. And <laughs> how <laughs> that, that's really, really great. So I learned a lot through the session, and I hope all of our attendees uh, learned how they could start through Katakoda to get started with Kubernetes, even if they know that don't know anything about Kubernetes, and then go to more complex uh, topics like Istio and uh, uh, Windows containers and all this stuff which you showed us. Uh, thank you very much.
It was very great. Um, hope we can have more sessions with you and with uh, the upcoming uh, Katakoda scenarios. And um, so I can announce that we are uh, working on an integration with Kubernetes IO to provide additional scenarios through Katakoda and for our trainings in the near future. Um, good. So if there is no questions from others here in chat, I don't see any question. Um, we'll wait uh, some seconds. So then, um, thank you very much again, all you lovely guys, Kubernetes, for joining uh, and supporting us. Perhaps uh, one point at the end, um, if you see my screen, um, we are going to, um, you see how uh, complex uh, the container ecosystem can get, but we love the community. We are working with the community together, and we are going to uh, provide some more hands-on training through our ritual classes very soon. And uh, hope if you would like to join us on our Slack channel, we'd be very happy to have you and work with you um, in the near future. So thanks again, jo uh, Ben. Have a nice vacation. <laughs> You're more than welcome. <laughs> and uh, hope we meet in person again uh, very soon. Excellent. Cool. Yeah. And as I said, um, all of the content is available for free on Catacoda. So you've now watched it. So you can now go and experiment in your own time and see all of the details. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to send me an email and I'm happy to go into details. OK. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you, Thanks everybody. So. And um, have a nice day, evening, where you are in the world. And um, see you later. Cool. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.